Warning, the following podcast contains irreverent humor, exceptionally nerdy opinions, potential cursing, and plenty of love for the prequels. If any of the preceding offends you, please turn off this podcast immediately, and may the Force be with you. Why, you stuck-up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder! You can't use that word! Only we can use that word! We'll use the Force. That's not how the Force works. You're tuned in to the Nerf Herder Council, your source for Star Wars opinion, conversation, and debate, featuring your hosts, JT. I mean, they killed his mother. What's he supposed to do? Send him a postcard? I wish you wouldn't have done that. Hey, Jay. I love a good three-way. Oh, my (laughs) goodness. Steve. Where did Ewok number five walk off to after the end of episode six? They want that crap explained to them, dude. <laughs> On this episode of the Nerf Herder Council, with six weeks to go before the official release of Rogue One, we go back to where it all began and discuss episode four, A New Hope. This is the Nerf Herder Council. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Nerf Herder Council. I am your host, JT. With me is my brother, AJ. And once again, we are Steveless as he is out on daddy duty. He seems to do that a lot. What's he thinking? I don't know, man. You know, good parenting really is when you get your kid involved with the show. That's what That's I That's my think. opinion. He was thumping on the table earlier. I mean, it, it made he had kind of a rhythm going to it. He could have done that. Besides, I mean, with how much Steve talks, Roland would pretty much just take over. <laughs> Roland would You'd sound never like know the, the difference. Roland would sound like the asleep Steve. But <laughs> anyways, uh, we do have two special guests on the show uh, this week. We have uh, our good buddy Andy Junkins, Hello. who listens to the show on a regular basis, and we've been friends for several years through uh, AJ. AJ's and mine, our cousin Christopher. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's on the show so he asked if he could come on at some point we're like yeah what the heck and without steve we figured let's bring andy on but we also have his 13 year old son grant how are you doing good and he wanted to come on because he listens to the show also and he actually has some opinions he wants to discuss with us uh that center around episode four and with rogue one coming out now in a little over a month isn't it great i heard that phrase and with Rogue One coming out next month, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it is just next month, isn't it? We're, I think we're in that time period where it's just starting to drag, where you're like, come on, get the movie out, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm, like, so ready for it. But I, I figured that what we would do this time is uh, go back and kind of delve into the film that butts up against Rogue One literally by a few minutes. You guys know that, by the way, that Rogue One ends a few minutes before episode yeah. four starts, mm-hmm. right? Okay. But yeah, we figured we would uh, kind of get into episode four and discuss that movie in depth. I know we talked about it a little bit, AJ, on the episode, comparing episode four with episode five, but we've never really just sat down and given our thoughts on episode four, which which could be cool because I know that you and I actually have a difference of opinion on it in certain ways. Yeah, and, I can't believe we've actually overlooked the original movie this whole time. We've covered all the other ones in detail, but we've never talked exclusively about A New Hope. Yeah, that's true. I mean, is it the one we haven't really got? Yeah. Well, no, we haven't really. Again, we haven't done Empire either. I mean, we've we've done four versus five, but we can go do that at some point. But but before we get started, I got to ask you guys. I'll start. I'll start with you, Andy. Like, how did you get into Star Wars? I have been into Star Wars since I can remember. We had a uh, a VCR tape of A New Hope, and the commercials ruined quite a bit of it. But um, you know, growing up in the eighties, um, I I had most of the figures. Wish I had them now. I wouldn't need to work, but uh, <laughs> right. You know, and it just started my my love affair with everything Star Wars. So I just kind of jumped from that point, and you know. Now, how how old are you? I'm Thirty five. Okay. Did you? So, hey, which ones have you seen in the theater? Well, if you include the special editions in the nineties, <laughs> right? I've I've seen all the original three in theaters, but. Uh, um, basically, it was the special edition, and then of course the the prequels, and then Episode Seven. Okay, 
So you were like you were like me. You really got your Star Wars fandom started off with the toys, then with the toys and yeah. the VCR tape. I mean, that's it, what it was. It had all the '80s commercials and everything. It was awesome. But uh, um, so my first true Star Wars was Force Awakens. Really? Well, new Star Wars. Was that the first premiere you've been to? You didn't go yeah. to the prequels when they came out in theaters. Well, the, you're right. I'm sorry. You're right. The prequels, yes. Okay. Are we going to start discrediting the prequels already? Damn it! No, we're not. <laughs> There's no discrediting. It's part of our universe. <laughs> we will you. accept it. <laughs> Take that, prequel haters. So, Grant, how did you get into Star Wars? Well, my dad got me into it mainly. Um, I start. I started watching from the first one on to um, seven, and I've liked it so far. And I'm excited for Rogue One. So. so for the record, as a good Star Wars parent, we watched them in the order that they were released. Okay, the that was going to be release order. Yeah, that so, was going to be my question. Not yeah. So that, but then then you can mess around with it from there. But yeah, he started with four. I I was actually thinking about that this morning because I've always been of the opinion that you should watch it starting with episode one. But it, the more I thought about what we were going to talk about today, I started thinking that I I started with episode four in 1980. So I was four years old when I saw it in the theater and. The the reason that episode four always has a different feel for me than any of the other movies was because when I was a little kid, it was the first thing I saw. It still resonates with me. It was so the, – the the contrasts in the movie were so stark, like the white stormtroopers and black Vader and then like the bright red lasers and everything. And it's like that movie just still reminds me of being a little kid. And I started thinking, I was like, you know, I think if I had to go back and rethink my opinion, I would say if someone's like in their 20s or something – Mm-hmm. Then you can say, okay, start. It's and they know it's the story of Darth Vader. They know already know what the whole thing is about. Start with Episode One and get it the story from start to finish. But for like a younger kid, start them off with Episode Four because that's really that's the how, really first one. Yeah, the exactly. Really one. And it's it's it gives you the feel of the entire saga. I think very it encapsulates really the feel of Star Wars all in one movie. Yeah, everything else is basically a spin off or derivative of what you see in Four. It all ties back to Four. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, Grant, you told us last night that episode four is your favorite of all seven movies. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because we meet Luke, and um, I I think it's just very, like, it's full of action, and uh, I just like how the story goes in it, and it basically starts off the whole series, if you ask me. So So. is is Luke Skywalker your favorite character, or who is your favorite Mm -hmm. character? And it doesn't have to be a character from episode four, by the way. Mm-hmm. But All right. um, but it should be. <laughs> Otherwise, you're wrong. <laughs> um, oh. It had to be Han Solo. There it is. Yes. That's why we got him on the show. Okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't present for the pre-screen interview, but now I see why you got in the chair. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Because Han Solo's the best. Yes. Actually, I'm okay. I'm okay with the Han Solo answer. I thought you were going to say Luke Skywalker, and then I was going to ask you why. Because I've, I don't know. We never got into the camp of Luke Skywalker. I've never seen him as the greatest Jedi ever, which is what you're supposed to believe. Yeah, you know that that is the thing. He's like supposed to be the greatest Jedi, but his I, training kind of sucked. He is a cool character, though. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see. Yeah, I think I we're going to find out more about him in terms of his Jedi powers, and I think his character is going to expand exponentially in episodes eight and nine, because if you think about it in the original trilogy, he was really kind of still just a Padawan. Right. And he didn't, we didn't see him as this all powerful Jedi. Like we saw Mace Windu and Yoda and Obi-Wan and stuff in the prequels. Like you never got to see that from Luke. It was just, he had barely learned. And all of a sudden he's got to take down Darth Vader. That's why I never understood the hype behind him, how he was built up to be so powerful. Cause we never saw him do half the things that the prequel Jedi did. It's like an underdog story, I think. It's it's kind of that, you know, like like the Indians were this year. Like everyone was rooting for us in the playoffs because all the injuries are like there's they have no business winning. Well, it, and uh, yet we're winning. Okay, it's a dumb correlation, but we were talking wrestling before we got on the air here, and we're talking about new wrestling versus old wrestling, all the legends that we grew up with. I I don't I like modern wrestling, but I don't believe that like the current champ Kevin Owens could hold a candle to, like, Randy Savage as heavyweight champion or Hulk Hogan, you know, like... Mm -hmm. So Kevin Owens is the top of the mountain right now based on his competition, but 
he he's not the greatest of all time or anything. And, and Luke Skywalker is kind of the same way where like, yeah, Luke was the most powerful Jedi of his time when there weren't any Jedi. But if he was actually in the ranks of the prequel <laughs> right. era Jedi Order, he'd probably be like middle of the pack. He'd be like a Kit Fisto kind of level. I like that comparison. There's nothing wrong with Kit Fisto. I like oh, he's my favorite Jedi. He's, he, yeah, one of mine too, for sure. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, yeah. Saying that Luke Skywalker's power is like, oh, you're basically Kit Fisto. If you fought the Emperor, you'd get cut down in about 15 seconds. That's the thing. Like He, he triumphed by turning Vader back to good, not because he was so great with his Jedi powers that he was able to take down Palpatine. Yeah, that's very. That's I never, true. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, again, but I think that's why episodes eight and nine are going to really. I think one of the best things that they, I can't say they, that they will do, but they have the opportunity to do, is to really expand the mythos of the character of Luke Skywalker and really show him as, I think what they always intended him to be, as you said, like the greatest Jedi, like you know, super powerful, like mm-hmm. the. If Anakin could have stayed good, he would have been Luke Skywalker kind of a thing. And I, I, honestly, I'm really looking forward to seeing that because it's it's something that, as you said, didn't really come across in the original trilogy. Yeah, Obi-Wan took all of his time in the desert to kind of bury his Jedi powers and, and blend in as much as possible because he had to. Now, Luke is playing that same type of character, except he's had 30 years to grow his Jedi powers and become more powerful. So now with all the the way they've expanded what the Force can do in every movie, it's going to be interesting now to see Luke Skywalker, the quote-unquote original Jedi, so to speak, based on like the movies and their release order, um, to see the classic Jedi using all the new Force powers that they've written into the lore. Yeah. I wonder how much of that they're going to have in there. They're probably going to scale it back a bit because, you know, they, they're taking more of an original trilogy angle on the sequels, but... You know, there's some things that you just can't undo. I mean, there's definitely a good side, light side, dark side, and then you've got all the powers that they've written in. I, I don't see. I don't think we're going to see him doing any force dashes or anything like you know in episode one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But okay, Dislo- we he'll dislocate a hip. We don't need that. <laughs> God, that'll be his force powers popping right. it back in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> He'll be like, oh, my hip, my hip, and then he'll wave his hand and go, all right, I'm good, let's go, keep going. <laughs> hey, if they want to pull from Legends like we were talking about, that was actually in the Episode 3 novelization, uh, basically saying that Yoda kind of channeled the Force when he needed to fight. So he was a decrepit old man, I guess. Um, <laughs> we'll never know his species. Right? Uh, so he was <laughs> decrepit and old, except when he needed to be young and lively and then he would just channel the force to move his body around the way his own muscles couldn't anymore. I wish I had that power so I could actually exercise. I hate I hate exercising. I'd love to channel the force and then I wouldn't be fat. Didn't you notice that about Luke in in Force Awakens where he's a little bit heavy set for a guy that has to go up like a million steps? Oh yeah. <laughs> Why do you think he's at the top? He doesn't want to go back down. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, how did he get up there? <laughs> Years ago. He turns around, he's like Thank God someone came up here. Do you have a sandwich? Yeah, right. Did you? You didn't happen to stop at the gas station on the way up here, did you? I need some smokes. I'm kind of stuck up here now. <laughs> Just hide out her like Twinkies or something. Right. <laughs> she bring. She's bringing up Doritos. <laughs> I still don't know why the Falcon didn't land on top of the mountain instead of at the bottom. It builds suspense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one. Of, that's going to be one of the deleted scenes in the 3D release in a couple weeks. It's going to be Ray Ooh. coming. Ray coming down off of the ramp of the Falcon, looking up and turning around and Chewie like. Really? Really, you furry bastard? Right. You, couldn't have, you couldn't have flown there's, up there? There's two clearings on the entire island, which is very small to begin with. You scout the first one. When there's nobody there, you know exactly where the <laughs> process of elimination. Yeah. Let's go, guys. Could have sped this up a little bit. <laughs> right? And then Chewbacca says something, and then it basically translates to, come on, you already get to be a Jedi. Quit being a whiner. I, I, I just get to sit here and watch watch Netflix while you're up there for a few hours with this old guy. <laughs> Actually, mate, Luke could have been in the Horcrux cave, so... <laughs> what the heck is that? It's, they shot the scene for Harry Potter and uh, uh, whatever Harry Potter 6 was called. There are too many Harry Potter references Half on this Blood show. Half-Blood Prince, for the record. Okay, yeah, Half-Blood Prince is when he goes with Dumbledore and gets the Horcrux out of the right. cave, and that was Skellig Michael that they filmed that on. There's a joke there, but I'm going to leave it alone. Wait, that's the same <laughs> island that they filmed... Force Awakens, the end of that? Skellig Michael. Yeah, they used they used the mouth of the cave for Harry Potter, and they used the entire island for uh, Force Awakens. That's actually where That's J.J. heard about it. So J.J. was tipped off by whoever directed Harry Potter 6. Look at you bringing some heavy Harry Potter knowledge to the show. 
Well, that's what happens when you date a Harry Potter fanatic. What, a Potterhead? Is that what they're called? That would know. be David Yates, just to let you know. <laughs> are they called Potter- Potterheads? Potterheads. <laughs> I totally want to call them that. I think that's oh what God. they are. And it's, <laughs> There it is. And I believe it's David Yates, because he's, yeah. al- he's also helming uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. There you go. But Ooh, this is a whole different good. podcast. We'll talk about this later. Wow. Yeah. All right, so Harry Potter is Snoke. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> it's a Star Wars. Yeah. Da- Daniel, the Muggles wouldn't get it anyway. Da- Daniel Radcliffe is Snoke. Uh, all right, so let's get into episode four a little bit. Yeah. Um, to start to start with, again, my history with episode four comes from actually having seen it in the theaters in 1980. So my my perspective is a little different um, because I really came into it was the first Star Wars movie I ever saw. I did not see Empire first, and for me, when you're a four-year-old kid, I mean, we know how much we love Star Wars to begin with, but when you're a four-year-old kid and you have that experience of sitting in a theater and stormtroopers are 50 feet tall and Darth Vader's even taller, like it, is- it affects you in, in ways that you just can't quantify. So for me, it resonates because it, it started my lifelong love affair with Star Wars, and I pass that on to AJ, uh, and then you know that it all, it all kind of went from there. Yeah, Grant, what was your first experience? What, what do you remember most about that first viewing? Of, like, just any Star Wars? Like, my first Star Wars I watched? Or... Yeah, because you saw four first, right? Yeah. So what what about that do you remember? Because uh, obviously it stuck with you enough to watch the rest, so... Like the like the movie? Like the plot, do you mean? Or Anything, yeah. How, yeah. Old, how old were you when you first saw it? Oh. Uh, you would have been 12, because like it was right before Force Awakens came out. So, oh, wow. la- so last year was your, so your was, first introduction um, to it? It's fresh. But, no. No, I mean, like, he's been subjected like to his whole life. Seven, when I was like but, eight. I okay. Was but introduced. remember his age, he's been more of the, the prequel kid. That's his yeah, generation. That's so, he, right. so he got to see it differently than we did, where we saw it, you know, four, five, six, one, two, three. But he got to see it in, you know, chronological order, okay. if you will, not the way they released. So he, he experienced it totally differently than we would have. Okay. So to answer your question, um, I remember how Leia. Um, gets captured by Darth Vader when they aboard the, oh, what is the name of it? The ship. Um, the white ship, the rebel ship. Yeah, Tantive Four. Yeah, sorry, and uh, um, and then she uh, makes the transmission with R two D two saying, talking to Obi Wan, and then after that she, they get taken, and then on Tatooine there's Luke and. He meets Obi Wan, and um, so what was what was your reaction to the movie? <sighs> yeah, what hooked you? Yeah, what when you were watching, you're like, holy crud! Like, what was your reaction to the whole thing? I I just liked how like the story is, and um, like the for the fact that like the force, like I just love like the like how that like works, and like the lightsabers, and <laughs> right, I just love it. I just love it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. The Force was a big thing for me, too. Just the, the thought yeah. that... Because every kid pretends they can do magic. It'd and be so We're not cool. getting back on Harry Potter, Andy. Don't worry. But, <laughs> but yeah, the, the idea that there's this magical force in the universe that you know you could you might just be able to tap into it's it's there just beyond your reach. Like, It'd be so cool to have the force. Yeah, it just like spurs your imagination. Yeah. What, what about you, Andy? My takeaways from episode four? Yeah. I remember all these years, one of the biggest things that... Um, when Vader and Obi Wan have like their confrontation, it always perturbed me why mm. Obi Wan just kind of disappeared. Right. So like I always I don't know why, but that's one of my earliest memories. Like why did this guy just totally disappear? Like where's his where's his mutilated body? He just got hit with a lightsaber. Right. Um. I it, think. And I just remember as a kid watching it, like just just how awesome. Like it it was my first experience at a real true epic movie. You know. Right. Um, before that, you know, my only my only uh, movie theater experience would have been ET at that point. So <laughs> I saw so yeah. Star saw Wars. One, yeah. mm-hmm. So Star Wars was the one that really got me thinking about you know, uh, just the whole a bigger story unfolding, and right. things like that. And um, I just remember how cool Darth Vader was to me back then. Right. Mm-hmm. Toys cool. not so much. You yeah. know, I mean, who has a lightsaber that just comes out of their hand, but. Um, <laughs> you wish you had one of those right now, believe but I mean, me. But you fell in love with the whole space exploration, the Millennium Falcon. You just, yep. you know, you might not have understood a lot of the adult conversations like that Han would have with with Leia and Luke. But you thought, man, this, you know, there's this group of friends that are just going out in space, and here's this giant, giant. Yeah, that scene where they were discussing yeah. the 401k. Uh-huh. 
I hate right. I mean, those grown up conversations that they would have. <laughs> we know what I mean. Like, <laughs> you know, they were comparing like, yeah, they were comparing like wallpaper patterns for their kitchen and, <laughs> and their trip to Home Depot that weekend. It's just, it was weird. Yeah. See, for me, I what what resonated with me as I as I say, you know, was beyond you know the stormtroopers just looked scary, and then Darth Vader was scarier. I immediately knew that Han Solo was the coolest dude in the galaxy. <laughs> like as a kid, yeah. I just. I latched onto Han Solo immediately, just the way he walked and everything. I'm like, that guy is the coolest guy ever to live, and it's always stuck with me. I have just loved Han Solo, so that's why I, I almost I I almost walked out of the theater the, the first time I saw Episode Seven. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And when I watched the movie on my birthday, I'm sure you, you've heard this episode. I did walk out. I watched episode seven in theaters on my birthday, turned 40 this year on February 26th, and I, I refused to watch him die. I'm like, no, I love Han Solo, and on my, on my birthday, he's living. So like, the movie stopped. But um, You know what, actually? Okay, he did survive. He fell into that lead-lined refrigerator from Crystal Skull, which is indestructible. So that's what happened. Listen, I love that movie, and I love that part of the movie, so we're not going to get into that because I'm in a, a small minority of people who have no problem with and that. And he lived because he's been drinking from the Holy Grail the whole time. Right. See, exactly. People don't, don't bring that up. It's all one shared universe. Yeah, exactly. You've got an immortal Han Solo because he drank from the Holy Grail and then crawled inside a lead-lined uh, refrigerator. Wouldn't that have been great, by the way, a little sidebar here? If he just – he doesn't get in the refrigerator – and you see this nuke go off, and then and then they show the mushroom. Guy. He comes flying out and just goes like tumbling, tumbling, and is like at like Mach two. And then he gets up and brushes himself off and just goes whoo. And then looks right in the camera and goes, "What? I drank from the Holy Grail in the last one. Like, I'm not gonna die." And he lands and then, in wha- an Amish village. This has been through so many uh, like adventurous and like dangerous journeys. That, like this, this yeah, is well, one time he dies. Well, to me, it's like yeah. Of all the things Indiana Jones has been through. Why now? You're, now people are going to complain about one thing. Everything he's done. I mean, he found the Holy Grail. What's more realistic: surviving a nuclear blast in a in a fridge or finding the Holy Grail? Thank you. Actually, finding the Holy Grail is fine. It's all those steps in that cave that he had to do to get there, like you know the invisible bridge. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, okay. The leap of faith. Right. But yeah. No. But anyways, back back to the point. Uh, for me, it was like Han Solo, and I, I think. And I I think one of the reasons that episode four is such a strong movie and such a great representation of Star Wars as a whole is the story is so clearly delineated and it's – you have all these extremes. Like you know like Luke Skywalker is such a good guy and you know that Darth Vader is such a bad guy and it's just this complete fight of – you know, the underdog versus the big bad bully. And you, you know, I mean, the bad guys don't just have, you know, spaceships and, and blasters and stuff. No, they've got, they've got a moon sized weapon that'll blow up an entire planet. Okay. You're like, what the heck is this? So it, it so clearly outlines what the rebels are up against and, mm-hmm. you know, what the crux of the story is. And it, I mean, as a, like I say, as a four year old kid, I knew exactly what was going on. Who was what? What represented what? It was so well done. It's funny you keep saying Luke Skywalker fighting Darth Vader because they didn't fight in that movie. Luke Skywalker was making the trench run with no knowledge that Vader was on his ass. Well, I don't mean they were actually physically fighting each other. I just mean you know who's the really good guy and who's the really bad guy. The conflict. Yeah. (laughs) There is no conflict. But yeah, I thought that was cool. I think I think that benefits from the fact that he didn't know if he was going to get a shot to make any more of them. So he had this entire saga in his head, and he had to distill it down to its core elements and cram them into that first movie just to see if he could even get a shot at telling more of the story. Mm-hmm. If it would do good. Well, he had it all written, but he... I right, mean, that's, what, he, but that's what I mean. If He knew he had one shot to try to hook everything that mattered into, into one two-hour film. Yeah. So he started right in the middle of it so he could pull elements from you know, the mention of the Clone Wars uh-huh. all the way through to the Force, to Jedi, like all the backstory that didn't even really play into it. Like the, the whole Jedi mythos really only got distilled down to the fact that Obi-Wan and Darth Vader had lightsabers. There was really not much more to it. It's, it's amazing when you look at that movie how much story they cram into that in two hours and ten minutes. Mm-hmm. Because you really get the... the Basically, the entire backstory of Star Wars, mm-hmm. most of it in that one movie, but it never feels like you're just sitting there bogged down with 
you know, explanation and, and exposition and all that. It never does. That's I actually okay. We're going to take another quick tangent. I'm sorry. My spoiler for your review of Doctor Strange felt very much the same way. Tons of new concepts and mentions and and asides, but you didn't need the full explanation of those things to get this story. It was just something that fleshed out the universe and made it feel more uh, fully realized. I, I I felt like the explanation of the stuff kind of overshadowed the actual story, but I, I also realized there's almost no way to do it any other way. Yeah, I mean but, that 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 cosmic sorcerer stuff was so weird and out there that you can't just. I mean, you can't gloss over it and just go straight to like focusing on all the story, but you also can't do it in the opposite and just sit there and explain how he's in school for years and years and you know just learning how to open portals and crap. So, but that's how episode four was so good because you got a few moments with Obi Wan where he's describing the Force to Luke. And talking about what what was there like three sentences about you know the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy yep. out of a thousand generations, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like that. That's it. That's all you heard, and it was enough. It, it, you got the backstory you needed, but then it was like okay, on to the next story beat. We we got that, and now let's move forward. So my question would be: There is being as young as I was when Episode Four, came, or well, when I started watching Star Wars. To, to me, that was my first experience with like a huge space battle. Like I don't, and you know, I didn't grow up watching Flash Gordon or anything like that. So like, I yep. don't know what we had as far as epic space battles. And that whole last half an hour, the trench run and everything was, was so just cool. awesome. Yep, so it, cool. It's it was one of those, and it's it's funny because I I looked up reviews of the movie from 1977, and all the ones that I found universally mentioned the scale and scope of it. And how grandiose it was, and and honestly, I I actually saw people online saying that you know oh the effects and stuff from the original trilogy don't really hold up, and I I could not disagree with that more. I mean, you still go back and look at that, and you're like, wow, they made a shoebox shooting blasters, and it looked real. Yeah, I mean, for crying out exactly. loud, exactly. You argue but that, the, but this generation is different from that generation. They didn't have the amount of like special effects in like computers that we had that that's we true now. you're mm-hmm. talking like a millennial now please don't do that <laughs> <laughs> i mean what now what do you think i mean when you i mean obviously obviously the the prequel trilogy looks different from the original trilogy mm-hmm. very different but yeah. i mean to you and you i mean grant you're growing up in a, in a generation like we have dr strange right now which is it's, like i haven't seen it yet unbelievable so. visually i mean you have to see it but mm-hmm. i mean the marvel movies the special effects that we have really at our is. at our disposal now to make movies. When you go back and watch episodes four, five, and six, do you think they still look great, or do you think it looks dated and um, old and unrealistic? Well, I know that like back then when when you guys were watching it, it, it looked like so good and realistic. But I mean, I, I I don't really pay attention to like the special effects and stuff. Like I I like I obviously like do, but like not as much. As I picked into like the storyline, but um, I think that this that the, like the special effects back then weren't as good as like now. But I mean, it, they made the they still made the movie look good. So, so that's, that's a generation gap because I think when I first saw episode one, I couldn't get over how unrealistically shiny all the spaceships were, like that Naboo fighter. See, I and but I, I I side I side with Grant, where to me the special effects are awesome, but the story stands out more to me. Mm-hmm. I, I and I think I just accept like I'm in the Star Wars universe. This is how it looks, and it's not it's it's none of it's real. I mean, it's not really it, there's nothing real about it. So I, that never bothered me. I, I I completely agree with Grant where it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's awesome. It looks good, but I'm I'm actually watching the story. You know, that's what's grabbing me. Yeah, I always. I always know it's a good movie if I get swept away in it and then have to read reviews later to find out all the mistakes that I didn't catch. Because you just get sucked in and you just overlook them, like effects flubs and things like that, like Grant, you're talking about. You know, it, if mm-hmm. the story's good, I'm not going to be worried about if the ships are too clean for me to believe and that kind of stuff. So, I, I think, I mean, I, and I agree with you though. I found myself in the prequels, and maybe that's just a product of being older when you see it, but I, I did find myself more times in the prequels being caught up as analyzing the movie instead of just swept along with the story. Yeah. And I I think that's one of my main problems with people criticizing the prequels is that people talk much more about the story in the original trilogy than they do 
in the sequel or excuse me the prequel trilogy and everybody's so worried about oh cg this and cg that and this it's like people forgot what's awesome about star wars in the first place is uh, they forgot that what's cool about star wars in the first place is that it's a great story and people were just looking for something to nitpick because it wasn't the original trilogy but the story is still really cool yeah. you know and i mean it's still star wars yeah, yeah exactly and i mean you know something like episode four i mean it, it's it's amazing to me because people still watch that movie and the the effect like you know back to the effects i think it still holds up so when i see people say the effects don't hold up and it takes away from it, no i completely disagree with that i mean i still pay attention to the special effects just not as much as the storyline yeah cause... Well, that's cuz you take it for granted that we have something so awesome you know it, w- yeah. it wasn't always the case like when episode 4 came out that was unheard of at the time like we really didn't have a lot of those cool effects you know mm-hmm. so they just you know it's commonplace now i mean but like i would i would like that's why I'm continuing because the story is good, and like the special effects, or they make the movie like, like they they basically make the storyline in a way, but like the story is like, like it's like hard to explain, but like the story is more important than the special effects. Like, it, it, and I think Doctor Agreed. St- I think Doctor Strange is a good example of that in that episode seven. When that came out last year, people went to that movie to go see Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Princess Leia. They they wanted to see these old characters. I think there's a lot of people going to Doctor Strange right now just to see the effects. They, they really don't care about the Marvel Universe, but they've heard how unbelievable it looks and they want to go see a show. Whereas I think in Star Wars, like what really stands out is the characters and the story that was created yeah. starting in episode four. And I think people went to see that as opposed to, oh, I want to see this enormous space battle thing of episode seven. No, they want to see Han Solo and Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia and Chewbacca and all that. You know, Yeah, that's what will make an enduring saga. But if you just want a, a high box office gross, then, yeah, load it up with special effects because people are going to go for the spectacle of it. But they won't yeah. watch it a second time because they've already seen it and that wow factor is gone. Yep. Mm-hmm. But I can always watch episode four again. I was doing it on the way over here. Okay, listening to it. I wasn't watching it while I was driving. <laughs> I was doing but, the same uh, thing. But yeah, and and just like even hearing the audio, I'm like, I remember this scene. and I, I, I don't need mm-hmm. to see it anymore, but I could still get swept along in the story. It was great. It's, it's absolutely, I mean, that movie is just so iconic and everything about it is just so strong. And I, I'm, I, I mean, I prefer episode five b- as a Star Wars movie, but in, in terms of just how influential episode four is it's really almost a perfect movie to me because it everything about it is just so memorable and indelible and it it, it just sets everything up so nicely and which which leads me to something i wanted to bring up to you aj because this is a point that you discussed with me a couple months ago it'd be interesting to get your guys your guys opinion on this andy and grant you said that you think it's the slowest moving of the movies and that there is too much exposition and I disagree because I was actually uh, listening slash listening to slash watching it this morning, trying to look at it from that perspective. And Luke Skywalker doesn't come into the movie for like 25, 30 minutes, something like that. I think I think I checked and it's it's a lot about the droids. You do see Vader and the stormtroopers and mm-hmm. Leia a little bit. And I guess nothing really happens. But you, to me, you never notice that. You know, and and there are movies, and I, I've seen a lot recently where you're like, man, oh man, when is something? You're looking at your watch, like, how long have I been watching this for? And nothing's happened. Star Wars is not like that. Episode four is not like that at all. But you disagree with that? Yeah, I actually do. Um, well, this came to light for me when I actually tried one of those movie marathons, just watching them in episode episodic order. Um, and when you go from episode three with that. You know, fight on Mustafar between Obi Wan and Anakin, and they're mm-hmm. throwing force powers, and there's lava and all that stuff. And then you pick up the next movie, and it's the binary sunrise, so and and yeah, like the, there's the pacing slows down so much. But that's that's a difference between 2005 movie pacing and late 1970s movie pacing. Audiences had way more patience back then. Yeah, but, very true. But in so, that time, they're building up the characters to what they are right now, like. We wouldn't. We basically wouldn't have seven if we didn't like build up or like if we didn't really build up Han like like mo- like a quarter of the movie. Right. Seven. Would Start establishing be here. him in four. Yep. Yeah. 
and 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 the other thing to me is also the and it's see it's it's hard to discuss because when one of them's made in 1977 and and that one comes after the one that's made in 2005 it's it's you, it's a difficult comparison because and the budget was what like 120th yeah and it's it was 6 or 7 million for episode 4 and it was well over 100 to 150 million or more i don't know for... episode episode th- episode 3 was the 6th movie so you're completing this monstrous story oh yeah whereas episode 4 as you as you stated was made with a shoestring budget by a guy who's going Nobody's going to watch this, and really on the fly with a ton of rewrites. Yeah, no, no one's going to watch this. It's not going to make any money. It's the only one I'm going to get to make. So he's just trying to make the strongest movie he possibly can, just to make a little money and hopefully get to make the rest of his stories. So it, it was done. Just the mindset around it was so different. Mm-hmm. But I'm not saying that it's the, it's bad or or the pacing is poor. I'm just saying it is the slowest of everything. I just, I just think, but the, the the state the galaxy was in at that point, the empire's firmly entrenched. Everyone is basically under their shoe. Nothing's happening. People are just, you know, oppressed and beaten down. And I think that the way the movie starts and showing all that kind of is a reflection of that. Mm-hmm. Well, episode three is it's it's all action the whole movie, arguably, and then you go to episode four, which it is slower paced. Because, but however, to me, that's the way it goes from watching episode two to episode three. Because I think episode two is the most boring of the prequel trilogy. I think they really that, that whole love story thing in the middle just dragged on. It went way too far. <laughs> And I, I just, I, I think that that's what it is. It, it, you know, went from being slower to being quicker with episode three, but then we kind of went the opposite way with episode four. It just slowed down, right? Mm-hmm. Because to us, that's what introduced all of us to Luke and Han and Leia. Yeah. But you know, after we've seen the the prequels, we've already had those characters established. So you know, it seems it's all about the pacing. I think. Um, I think they saved all the action for the last moment in the Death Star when they destroyed it. It definitely builds and, in a very typical yeah. movie fashion. Because that, that part's like, what, 20 minutes? Yep. Would you say? At yeah. least. Yeah. Not half an hour. And, and, and it's really action-filled. Yeah. And, and, and again, I think that comes down to what I was saying, Grant, about the episode four was made with a completely different mindset than any of the other movies. Mm-hmm. Because it was it was basically a standalone for all George Lucas knew. So he had to make it this big epic thing with a st- kind of a standard movie outlook. Whereas once that's a huge success, when you're making Empire, you can start taking some chances because you know there's going to be something coming after it. So mm-hmm. you're you're basically writing something knowing that you don't have to worry if there's a weird ending or a cliffhanger or you know if if the high spots come a little earlier in the movie like because it's it's you're writing a movie that's now part of a bigger a bigger story. You- it's not it, it's not just one you know, single entity that has to stand alone. A quick side question on it, because you know more of the backstory of the, how these films are made. When he was going into Empire Strikes Back, I mean, obviously, Star Wars set the world on fire, and it was a huge smash. <laughs> Did he know when he was making Empire that he would be able to make Jedi as well? Yes. Okay, okay. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. all right, to set up a cliffhanger like that <laughs> without yeah. knowing yeah. if you were going to be able to, you know, make good on that? No, I mean, he he had made so much money that he financed, uh, he financed, empire on his own and i mean he t- he took okay. out bank loans one of the one of the one of the famous stories um i don't know i don't know if and andy and grant if you guys have seen the documentary empire of dreams it's oh, it's, it's no. on youtube it's it's it's, it. it's on the it's on the special uh on the dvd release of the original trilogy it's on the special features disc it's like two and a half hours but the full thing is on youtube you can check it out i, I highly recommend it what it's is it it's all it's all about it, it's a two and a half hour documentary about the making of the original trilogy oh. It's unbelievable. I can I can basically quote it chapter and verse. I've watched it so many times. That's on the DVDs, the special edition. Yeah, thing. it's on the fourth the we fourth disc of the DVD special edition, the silver right. box. Yeah, we have that. But I one of the so. one of the famous stories is that I mean they you know Lucas put his own money into it, but he did have like bank loans and stuff like that to make bills and everything. And they went over budget, and one of the banks had a new like finance manager or something, and basically wouldn't give him any more money, and he almost had to shut Empire down. Because he couldn't make budget to pay salaries one week or something, and it was like, you know, it's the, the guy in the in the documentary is like, yeah, it's the guy who was working for Lucasfilm doing finance stuff was like, yeah, you got you know, the biggest bank and biggest entertainment bank in the world giving money to make the sequel to the biggest movie ever made, and they're telling him no, like, <laughs> what is that? So, I mean, he knew that he was 
going to be able to make Jedi because everything was so successful. He was financing his own thing. He was making his own companies and stuff like that. So he knew. Okay. So, but it was still kind of shoestring in a way because it was, as they, as they say in the documentary, as he's setting it up, it could have just as easily failed as it did become this massive global empire. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. But, yeah, no, I, and I think that's the thing. Like, one of the things that sets, you know, episode four apart is that it was, it, the, the the mindset behind making it was so different. I mean, even, you know, going into Empire, you know you're going to get to make Jedi. And then when you start the prequel trilogy, you already know there's going to be three movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the same thing here with episode seven, eight, and nine. You know, episode seven, to me, I mean, my thoughts are very clear on it. And I I just wonder how it's... Rogue One is going to be a very interesting movie for me because that Rogue One is going to have the spirit of Episode Four because it's not going to have three movies behind it to keep explaining something in Rogue One. It's a standalone movie that has to be good in and of itself, and there's nothing else tied to it. True, I never thought of it like that. It's going to have the spirit of Episode Four with the speed of Episode Three. Yeah, Yeah. but I think that's a good comparison. Well, let, let me go back if I might just a little bit. So, other than story, don't you think the the ways that they made films back filmmaking in general was just different for third, you know, a 30 year gap. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. they, you know, I mean, right now we're in an, yeah. we're in an era where we can instantly watch Netflix. We can, we want stuff quicker and, and we still complain about it. I, I think that says a lot for the filmmaking as well. Just back then, you know, mm-hmm. movies weren't just, didn't hit the ground running and just kept going. They, you know, they built up to something Yep. yep. and now we just expect it, you know? Well, like, and it's we, one of those, it's one of those rare movies. I think that may, that it's made back in that time. And kids, you know, Grant's age still love it. I mean, how many how many yeah. kids do you know that can say that one of their favorite movies was made in 1976? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter what yeah. the, what the subject um, matter is. There's, there's a lot. Th- yeah. Well, I, I was going to crack a joke about some other 1970s movie, and I really can't think of one to use right now. Yeah. I mean, but but Star Wars stands the test of time, and it it had a target audience of children back in the late 70s. But even kids now, like little kids that are five, six years old now, still love Episode Four. So, mm-hmm. it, it, whatever they did in that movie, I think it's like still resonates said. exactly as it did when it came out sure. May twenty fifth of seventy seven. I think it's like you said they they worked in such broad strokes. You know, you had white stormtroopers, black Darth Vader, bright red lasers, good guy is Luke Skywalker, bad guy is Darth Vader. All right, it's simple, it's easy to grasp. So, you know, if you're working for a young audience. That's what you have to do is you have to work in grand scales so it's very clear who to cheer for, who to hate, and what the conflict is. And that's set, and that because of that, you can then in later movies work with, you know, the different background stories and paint more shades of gray into it. So it's a great starting point, but it's also good on its own because everything is so delineated. You don't have to explain that stuff because it's it's so polar opposite. But maybe that's why why a lot of people complain about the prequels because you really didn't know who was good and who was bad. There was mm-hmm. that great, you know, there was yeah. that you, know, you didn't that. you weren't quite sure, but yeah. you know, you could jump right back into episode 7. Oh, hey, there's there, you know, here's so and so. There that's the empire. They're bad, but the prequels, I mean, just, you know, I don't think it just clearly defined who was good and, and who was bad and we just didn't have that simplicity of storytelling. And ironically, like not not to get off on the prequels, but that's actually what I enjoyed about them. I loved the mystery of it. It was cool. And I mean, a lot of people now say, well, how can you not know that, you know, Palpatine is the emperor? Well, a lot of people didn't. Yeah. I mean, I, I've actually watched it with people, the, you know, sat with people watching the prequels for the first time. And we get to episode three and they're like, that, like, this guy's acting like the emperor. And then he turns it up and they're like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, people don't, people don't know. I think episode four even comes down to the music in that aspect of, of simplicity. Like we were yeah. talking about how iconic the themes are. Yeah. And it's true because every every iconic scene is made iconic because of the soundtrack behind it. It tells yeah. the story. And, and every character exactly. has, its, has its own, his or her own theme. Mm-hmm. Right. In fact, we did, we did the theme song in band. Really? Yeah. That was always one of my favorite things oh, to play. Awesome. I played drums. You guys didn't know. No, I did not know. That's awesome. Yeah, we played it in band. It was a little fun. rock star. It was fun. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. See, I can relate to that. I'm a musician. I'm down with that. Mm-hmm. I never got, you know, I, I did get to do Star Wars music in school once. It's fun. I was in, I think, sixth grade or fifth or fourth or something. No, it was no, way before that. I was at Zeller's, I think. I think it was like first grade. We did uh, Yub Nub. <laughs> Yub Nub. right. <laughs> yep. the, the, the original ending song of, of oh, Return geez. of the Jedi with the Ewoks, I, I did Yub Nub. 
You know, I should have known back in like eighth grade when I was in middle school band that we were destined to have a show like this because even back then I was I was a trombone player in band. I did marching band and stuff. He was a tromboner. I was a tromboner. I, I made that joke at uh, school too. We don't like that joke. <laughs> they laugh no, at it. You don't like that joke. You used to hate when I did that. I loved it. My friends laugh at it. I wouldn't like well, my us tromboners don't we dro- like that we joke. Jo- we joke around like that. But anyway, well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be trombone eye? Just pluralize it. <laughs> You're not the only one. Anyway, go on. It's not trombonus. Oh, <laughs> Stay topic on here. target. <laughs> yeah, we got the sign right over there. <laughs> Stay on target. <laughs> this one time at band camp. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, even back then, I we, we had like a medley of movie themes that we would play. And every time the Star Wars one would come up, I would love playing it. But even back then, I was listening to the instrumentation. I'm like, that's not the actual score. This is simplified. I want to play the real thing. Yeah, we played the simplified version. It was it was pretty stupid. Not right. Gonna lie. We, all we did was just the same exact notes, just eighth notes. No, just nonstop. It's so boring. Yeah, no, <laughs> no nuance like the London, uh, London, London Symphony. Symphony. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, and that's. Like, and I never got to play the actual official instrumentation. I would love to play the I, full on version. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, like we've talked about the soundtrack, but I, I think it still bears repeating that I, I could probably pull up the soundtrack now for you guys and just click to one and and play it. And you guys go, oh, that's what, at this part of the movie. Yeah. And oh, that's at this part of the movie. And you can't do that with any of the other films except for ep- episode five. You could do the part with the uh, asteroid feel like. Yep. And then obviously the imperial theme comes out of that, and but then really the only other piece after that I think would be Duel of the Fates in Episode One when Maul is fighting Obi Wan and uh, Qui Gon, and then maybe the music behind the Obi Wan Anakin duel in Episode Three, Battle of Brothers. Yep. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I I I know the soundtrack to Episode Three a little better because I have it and I love it. It's my. It, favorite. it is a great soundtrack. It yeah. is a good one. But episode There's, Episode Four, like every part of it, like I I literally can listen to just the soundtrack because I have the one that literally goes from start to finish of the movie. It's not just bits and pieces. Oh. And you, as I'm listening to the soundtrack, the movie's in my head. Like yeah. you, you just yeah. know what's happening. Like it's it, so vivid. It tells like the. It gives the feeling of the part. Like, yeah. Like it does. When the it, fights happen, and it gives like the like the uh, heart, like the faster heartbeat, and yep, like it gets you worked up. And it, it's like that stark contrast I was talking about. It comes across in the music too, because the music is so up or it's so down. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's. I mean, the movie really is a, a kind of like an exercise in extremes in a lot of ways. You know, things are so good or so bad, or I mean, and it's it's just very very demonstrative. Yeah, which also means that when there isn't music, those quiet beats, those things are so much more dramatically impactful because it's a it's a breather where you get to like focus strictly on the dialogue for a change, which almost never happens in Star Wars. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like the absence of music is actually just as powerful as the score itself. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We can all agree with that, I think. I agree. So one of the other things that I thought was really cool about episode four. Um I lost my train of thought there for a second. Well, I was I was trying to. <laughs> I just was about to make a point. Completely lost it. Well, I was trying. I was trying to get a point in before because we were talking about the pacing of the movie and everything. Well, since I forgot mine, you go right ahead. <laughs> there, there's a solid like three act structure to the movie, right? And and here is where I sometimes have a hard time getting through episode four. The first act is all the exposition. Act two is the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star escape, and then Act three is the assault on the Death Star by the Rebel fleet. By the time you get them out of the Death Star, I'm spent as an audience member. Like, I'm done. I'm exhausted. It was exhilarating just to get out with all the time they spent there just having to break in and get the princess and then fight their way back out. And Mm -hmm. then we're not even to the main conflict and climax of the film yet. I could, like, actually stop right right at them escaping and consider that a fulfilling good movie. Yeah. That final battle, I'm like, Oh boy, it is hard to to be emotionally invested at that point because your your tensions and emotions were already so peaked. To come back and try to like elevate beyond that is almost too much. You know, it's like it's like a double encore at the best rock concert you've ever been to, where you're yeah. you're already there, and then you got to get more excited. It's just <laughs> right. God, it's like that's that's where honestly that's that's where I feel like the movie's running time is right in line, like within like ten minutes of any other Star Wars movie. 
mm-hmm. but it feels so much longer because the emotional the emotional climax for me was always getting out of the Death Star. So the final Death Star battle is bonus material. It, it yeah, I agree with that. It, it's almost like yeah. three mini movies like stuck together very well, mm-hmm. and it, it does it does feel longer than it than it actually is, but not in a way that it drags and you're sitting there like, oh my god, when is this over? But I mean, there's just so much happening that you're so invested in it because, like, the first part when you're meeting the characters on Tatooine and they go to Mos Eisley and stuff like that, you're like, "Whoa, man!" And then, like you said, g- getting you know trapped on the Death Star and having to get out of there is like a whole separate thing, and you get all into that. And then the space battle at the end, yeah, you're kind of you're kind of spent. And when you say it like that, it kind of makes me think of it's all it almost is representative of what the characters have got to be feeling. Like Luke is just like he. Just does everything he mm-hmm. can to get the heck out of the Death Star. He's like, "Oh my god!" Like, and he's like, "No, no, no! Get in that plane! You got to go blow up the Death Star." Yeah, that like, is a oh. that is a long day at the office. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> he loses his family in the morning. Then he has to escape the Death Star in the afternoon. Yeah. Then, then he's got to blow up the Death it. Star at night. And, and then you're gonna need a nice cold and cup of blue milk <laughs> to wash it down, just <laughs> right. to get over it. To... <laughs> Space cookies and blue milk. <laughs> it's, just cry into your blue milk because your Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. Are <laughs> well, Leia, right. Leia did give him that blanket. It's true. That's, well, that's true. true. So he was all recovered. That's all you need is you need just a warm hug with a nice cozy blanket, and then it's time to go blow up the Death Star. And then, <laughs> what if that blanket was a piece of crap? It wasn't worth. <laughs> He's like, man. I can't even get a good damn blanket in this. What a horrible day. It's, like, just, it's just been sitting inside R2 for years. Just some old blanket <laughs> from when he was a little moth eaten. When he was got a little. in it and everything. <laughs> little droid. <laughs> that thing is like a giant piece. It's like an Afghan from like Shmi. What if it turns out to be one of Obi Wan's tunics? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> or adult Plot diaper. Twist. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> my God. So if I could, I, I, I was, watching that last night, I have two. Two little questions okay. in, this, in this in the same scene that I I was always curious about. So one, when the special editions came out, and you know Lucas did his thing where he just blew everything back up. So why why was it necessary to change Obi Wan's scream to scare away the Sand People? I listened to that this morning. Is, I don't like the new one. I, well, my explanation for that is I never knew why the Sand People really ran off initially. I just saw Obi Wan on, on the ridge going booga booga, and I'm. <laughs> they, <laughs> that's really what it looks right. like. But it had more of an animalistic scream to it when he the but first. I didn't know he was screaming. I I I, I couldn't tell with the okay. original cut. Okay, I just thought he was. was he comes out and he's like, and then the sand people are like, ah. I've got the real answer if you want to know it. There well, is a real answer. Well, I'm giving there my. Is. I want to hear it because I'm curious about this. I he, yeah. they had to make to me they had to make it. So that it was obvious what was going on and what scared him off. But it, what is... Okay, the first sound was a stock sound. They used it on 1960s TV shows. Like, it was not made for the movie. So basically, when the special edition came out, he's like, I don't, I don't want stock sound. I want custom sound. So he replaced it. And then decided he didn't like it. So they did it again for the Blu-ray, and I I think they should have just stopped because I still actually prefer the original. I, I do, and, mm-hmm. and on that so on that yeah. same note, did they still use the uh, Wilhelm scream when uh, Boba Fett falls into the Sarlacc pit? Yeah, and yeah. I, I yes. never paid attention to that. They do, yeah. But he's not a fan of stock sound effects, and that's well, that's it's almost like a it has classic. Its own name, the, the, right? Wil- the Wilhelm scream is actually a st- is, is actually a joke within the movies. It that's is? A, that's a, we, we got that oh. from Ben Burt himself. That's we, a, we ate lunch with him. So that's a Star Wars. Sa- it's, the star, I mean, yeah. it's, no. used, it's used everywhere now. They, they have it once in each movie. It's and a stock the, sound. It's a stock sound that they used in Star Wars, but it's become a movie making meme. Like every sound yeah. designer uses it. Ben Burt told us when we ate lunch with him at the first celebration we went to at 2010 that. He has other sound designer friends, and if you listen, if you look in the prequels, it's pretty funny when you know what you're looking for. They would their their joke to each other in the movie would be to use the Wilhelm scream, but in a really stupid spot. Like I, one of the one of the prequels, the Wilhelm scream, some dude just kind of falls over, but it does the Wilhelm scream. It's yeah. like the weakest death. It's like almost he tripped, but it goes ah. <laughs> Like and that's that's him trying to make his other sound designer buddy laugh and I guess there's other movies out there where his friend did that to him and it's I mean they, they have these like two hundred million dollar movies and these guys are giving each other the finger I mean yeah. it's like it's the funniest thing ever I'm like that is so admirable I would do that it's myself. in all seven yeah yeah uh-huh. the sound is very okay intimate, yeah though. that I did not know I have to yeah it's everywhere it's it's in a lot of yep. movies other than Star Wars because the guy very the guy infamous. that yeah 
There's and even the, a beer called Wilhelm Scream. Really? Yeah, there's a pumpkin <laughs> beer called Wilhelm Scream. <laughs> you know what? If okay. I if I if I brewed that beer and I had the money to do it, I would make every time you I would put something in the cans or bottles where every time you open it, it would do the Wilhelm Scream. Right? That'd, That'd be great. Be cool. I would be like this would be awesome. Wouldn't it be great? Just crack it with a beer. Ah! Like, <laughs> so what? Well, okay, Interesting. So, so the second one, and, and, and this is. That. So the second question I had, <laughs> which I never understood, even in, and I haven't read a lot of the novels, so I'm sure it's in there. But how does why does Obi Wan not remember the droids? There's got to be an explanation for that somewhere, right? Uh, I don't think there's an official one. The fan theory is just that he was playing along. Yeah, he seemed pretty serious. Yeah, I mean, obviously he should remember the droids. Yes. So, but to we, to me, I've always said that that's one of those things you can't explain everything. And the dialogue was written like that in 77, and you can't go back and change the dialogue now. So it's just sure. one of those rare things you can't really explain. So we'll just, con- we'll just, we'll just mark that to a continuity issue. Yeah. yeah. It's like and that, and, that. that yeah. and you know, Leia saying she ha- actually has memories of her mother. I have, I have one that I wanted to bring up. And I guess we've, we've we've talked about the fact that we love the movie, so now we can start nitpicking it. Okay. Um, this is going yeah. out on the internet, so we got to complain about something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, right. The line I've never really understood was when the tractor beam nabs the Falcon, and Han Solo says, "I'm a full power. I'm going to have to shut down. They're not going to get me without a fight." What fight? <laughs> right, like yeah. you just you just said you have to shut down. That that's not fighting. <laughs> that's giving up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, because. I I never saw it that way ever. He because, because he's letting himself be captured. Right, that's not fighting. But he be, said because he, he can't get out of the tractor beam. Yeah, he can't get. What's out. he gonna do? Just keep putting it in reverse and blow but, out but the Obi, engines? But Obi Wan is the one who said there are alternatives to fighting. Well, yeah, but Han close. Solo, if you're if you're gonna fight a tractor beam, he's gonna blow out the engines and break the ship, and then when they get in there, how they're gonna get out? So he needs to save all of his energy to get the hell out of there. So he's a liar. That's Isn't why that he's a dead. liar? That's, that's what I don't get. He's like, I have to shut down. They're not getting me without a fight. So, because, he, lay, because, so he lays <laughs> in the ground waiting for the Empire to pick right. him up. Because, it, because if he doesn't shut down, it's going to destroy his ship, and then he's stuck. So what is his, Then he can't fight. What is his fighting plan? To save power on the ship to where he gets in there, find a way to get the hell out. But how are you going to get out if not on the Millennium Falcon? Well, he said he'd take a stab at it. <laughs> yeah, right? Through the heart. Uh, through the armpit, as uh, it were. I thought you were actually referencing Obi Wan. No. Me? Well, yeah. I mean, we're talking episode four, so if you're right. talking about someone getting cut down, I assumed it was Obi Wan you were talking about. <laughs> that time, no, no, no. Uh, Which is transcending sequels here, and that okay, that's one that people love to talk about online. So, I, Grant, I'd love to get your take on this. The whole line of Obi Wan says, "If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine." But he dies. So. What were you expecting with that line? Because when I first saw the movie, I'm like, okay, dude's going to go like superpower. He's going it, to, it's like, you know, in other movies where like, dude comes up to the biggest, most muscular guy in the room, punches him in the face, and the dude just like turns his head back and like smiles at him. Like, that's what I was expecting from Obi Wan was like, okay, cut me with the lightsaber, and now I'm going to be like super oh, powerful. Spear. Like, draw power from your lightsaber instead of be cut well, down by it. Well, well, I thought that like he meant that he was like, sh- one of the strong Jedi's, and that he was gonna like stay alive and just like try his best to like fight against the um just the stormtroopers and the yeah right like he was kind of impervious because yeah yeah like, so what I, happened to him? I, what what do you think happened to him? I think that it's something that most Jedi's don't understand, like don't get like I think it was like the Force he used like like the Force has a, an ability that we don't know yet and um. He it just like brings him to like a, a place that like he uh, chose when he was young, or his parents chose for him when he wanted to um, like well like like I can't really explain it, but like he knew like those like when the lightsaber was coming, I thought he was gonna like die, and I, I just I don't know. But remember, he comes back to mentor Luke. Yeah, as a force ghost, and they mentioned that at the end of episode three when he says like how to how to return from the from the nether worlds of the force, mm-hmm. how to commune with him. I will teach you. So he actually had been taught by Yoda how to transcend mm-hmm. death, basically. Or it's foreshadowing now that Marvel owns 
Star War, or you know Disney owns Star Wars and Marvel. What if he just has the Ant Man suit and he's just talking on <laughs> Luke's shoulder? <laughs> Oh yeah, he <laughs> just shrinks down. <laughs> Obi Wan is Ant Man, and and Vader knew that because he goes he goes to stomp on the robe like I'll get. I know you shrunk down to the size of an ant. You are going to die. That's what he was doing. He, <laughs> you know, he, he couldn't use a magnifying glass because he has to use the mask. Oh my so he just, I'll just stomp on you. Vader wasn't like, what's going on here? Vader's like, I'm gonna. He's an ant. I know this trick. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's now it all ties together. I like that theory. <laughs> and it is Obi Wan as Ant Man. That's Snoke. That's why the Ant Man is Snoke. All right, you heard it here <laughs> first. Well, look, look how look how big Snoke was. He turned into Giant Man. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. That actually makes Dirt perfect sense. See, when I, when mind blown. Darth Vader's Hulk. <laughs> Hulk. When I when I first when I first saw the Obi Wan thing, and he said, "If you strike me down, I should become more powerful than you could ever imagine." I went, "Wait a minute!" But he's already got a lightsaber. I was like, "Whoa, what's going to happen with him?" That's he must be way more powerful than Vader. So I was like, "What's going to happen?" And he he killed him. I was like. Well, why would he do that if he's going to become more powerful? And then he says, run, Luke, run. I'm like, he's dead and he's talking to him? Like, he is powerful. So I was like, whoa. Like, he didn't, didn't really know, die. Like, I didn't even know he was dead at that point. I thought, when I first saw it, I thought he, like, teleported. Apparated. Now it's coming yeah, to right? think oh, I, dude, I just, Again with the Harry Potter. The, the flu network. I just thought <laughs> of this. I, I What if uh, he went into, like, there's a way that the Force can go into somebody's mind. He went into Luke's mind. Well, I mean, he's speaking from somewhere. He's dead. Yeah. Well, see, now, like, now you're now you're getting into of, a fan theory cause he, cause he knew from that he episode was seven. Because he he because when the lightsaber was coming, like he knew that something was like we knew that something was going to happen. So, like, I think that like he went into Luke's brain, like like Luke's self. Like he transferred and, his spirit into yeah, Luke. Like it's. Yeah. Well, don't they call that becoming one with the Force? Yeah. Like, isn't it the technical? Like I, like, I just thought of that. So, what does that mean? Well, they've since developed it into becoming a woman with the force means you're just part of the general cosmic energy of the universe. But being able to retain your individual spirit amongst all that is the force power that was heretofore unknown. Yeah. You have control over your eternal spirit beyond the physical. Which was hinted at from Yoda in, at the end of episode three when Yoda's trying to teach, tell him he's going to teach Obi-Wan how to commune with and they, Qui-Gon. They actually hinted at it in episode two. And there's a lot of Clone Wars stuff about this, too, in uh, Season 6. The last episodes, actually, the the Yoda arc that finishes out the series. They talk about Qui-Gon's in there, and he talks about the living force versus the cosmic force and that kind of thing. Yeah, and you you hear when when Anakin is cutting down the sand people in Episode 2, you can hear uh, Qui-Gon go, Anakin, no! Like, that's that's Qui-Gon, like, trying to talk to him through the force and be like no dude don't don't be doing that and then you know they explain it more in episode three so yeah it just it, to me again i just i just thought he was like more when he said i'll be i'll i shall become more powerful than you can ever imagine I'm like he's stronger than vader holy crap like that was to me as a kid it elevated him to this level of well how is this going to happen like darth vader and, but then again, at the time, Vader, to me, I think with the passage of time, Vader became stronger to me because I saw him do the force choke mm-hmm. in the movie. But the rest, he was just kind of bossing people around. I knew he was bad, but it was almost like not as bad as we learned that he was because one thing that I still don't understand is him answering to Tarkin. I mean, it's, oh yeah. It's so to me, I'm like, okay, he's he's only second in charge, and then Obi Wan Kenobi's got all this force stuff. You know, he's influencing the stormtroopers to you know let him pass and all this other kind of thing, and you know he's doing a little hand wave, and they look over here so he can shut down the tractor beam, and you know, so it was. And then Obi Wan says, "I should, I should become more popular." I'm like, man, he really is way more powerful than Vader. And I got to say, that's one thing I hope that is a, a, some kind of detail they bring up in Rogue One. I know it's probably not central to the story, but. I hope Tarkin is in there or mentioned somewhere in Rogue One to find out exactly why Vader got demoted. Well, he's got to be in I, Rogue One, right? Yeah, I think it's he was been at the end of Episode Three. So has I mean, it, they they set it up already. Has it but not been announced yet? That the, I I I think I if, even in the I new canon, say, they still haven't really clearly identified because well, Cole, here's the other problem: is Tarkin is referred to as Governor Tarkin by Leia, so he holds yeah. a political title. 
okay. yet also he's also referred to as Grand Moff Tarkin, which is a military rank. So he's kind of serving dual roles, and where he's at and what he's doing with regards to the building of the Death Star kind of changes over time. Like he was directly overseeing it. I forget which book it was. I think it was um, either Lords of the Sith or whatever the the one that kicked off Rebels, A New Dawn. Um, or actually, it might have just been Tarkin. It, it, it was Tarkin itself. It was the book about Tarkin where um, he directly oversaw the building of the Death Star over Geonosis, you know, as we saw in Episode 3. And then as soon as it was space-worthy, it, it traveled to some unknown corner of the galaxy to finish itself so you know, it could be done in the shadows away from the eyes of anybody. Isn't that the story Rogue One is telling? Would they go to Jetta to that, get the kyber crystals I would, or whatever? I would guess that's Jetta then. Um, By so the we'll, way, we'll find so out. Grand Moff Tarkin was the Dwight D. Eisenhower of the galaxy. <laughs> I was just thinking that actually, uh, but I wasn't going to go there. Oh, he holds political rank political and, 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 and military. military yeah. <laughs> so, are we ever going to see a video in the deleted scenes of the interview with Grand Moff Tarkin with Palpatine? So, what are your interests? Yeah. <laughs> What brought you in today? Are you evil? <laughs> Where do you see yourself in three to five years? <laughs> if, if I told you I'd wanted to oppress an entire galaxy, what would you say to that? <laughs> Just put that, put like typical interview questions to like Palpatine's voice with Grand Moff Tarkin as like the interviewee. Can we yeah. petition the robot chicken guys to do that? That would be so funny That'd if they did. Wouldn't so that be great? Good. That would be... <laughs> So I've got your resume here, and I see that you have... Uh, <laughs> In the second interviews with Vader. Yeah, right. Vader's more like HR. It's, yeah. just, it's just Seriously, breathing. Yeah. It's just yeah. breathing in a stare down. Yeah. Here's your W-2. Yeah. <laughs> Who is your beneficiary? <laughs> Seriously, how did Vader get, like, how did Vader get demoted? What did he screw up? Did he have, like, a sexual harassment claim against him or something? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that would be a hard thing. That would be a really hard thing to do in that suit. I, I think that's one of the things that he's not able to do. He was walking around using the force trying to get chicks to flash him. <laughs> you say, will pull your boobs out. I say, sure, sure. Vader, get over here. <laughs> oh, crap. Sure, he force choked by the throat all the, all the men, but we don't know what he was choking on the women. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> this this got out of to hand. a dark place, this line His of thinking. His little lightsaber. <laughs> oh, boy. His little lightsaber. Oh, oh boy. Yes, we... We don't need to be wondering what he was doing with his little lightsaber. <laughs> We're corrupting the poor child. Now he's getting in on the jokes. He does have that little chamber that he goes into. <laughs> Watch his intergalactic porn on right. it. <laughs> Twi'lek porn. Oh, God. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, oh so God. so we got a few minutes left, and, and we actually did just touch on something. So... Was everybody we, we, on the... You just had we touch just, on something. Right, we were touching yeah. on... <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, boy. So, did you guys all think the same thing I did the first time you saw the lightsaber? You're like, what is that? That is the coolest thing I have ever seen. I, I was actually... Actually, I don't remember the first time, but now that I look at it and I think about it, I'm like, that is insanely dangerous. Like, holy crap, you're just like going to light up a laser in this very small, confined space. How do you not cut the crap out of everything in that room by accident? You were four years old and that's your thinking? No, I don't You see remember. a laser sword and you're like, that is not OSHA compliant. <laughs> 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 well, it, it, it was awesome when, you, when, when Obi-Wan first ignites the lightsaber. It's like, and, and I got the same feeling in Episode 7 where Finn lights it up for the first time when he's yeah. right when he has that you know, little battle with Traitor. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. And it was just it sounded so cool in the theater. Yep. And it was just like, oh my god. Is it just awesome. me or the first time he ignited it sounded like a different sound? It I think that uh, was every on, other yeah, time sounded that was normal, on purpose. But, well that was on purpose. Yeah. You know, it that's kinda like how it makes sense. In, in any like super, Oh, because he wasn't like a he wasn't like a force user, so it sounds different or something. I don't think I think it was just build up, right? It's, like, it's just storytelling. It's like every time in Transformers when you see a guy transform for the first time, it takes like thirty seconds to do it. And then the next time it's like two seconds, okay, I'm a truck. Yeah. <laughs> it's Optimus Prime, the first time he transformed in the original, it took him like an hour just right. to transform. And it's like, oh my god, like Megatron just killed us all. Thanks. <laughs> if, I, if, yeah. I, if I if I could throw in another little teeny sidebar, I've always wondered about that with those transformations. Like they take like thirty seconds. I'm like, why wouldn't you just take like you know how like when you stop somebody riding a bike, you throw you chuck a stick through the spokes. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you just put a big metal rod in the middle of whatever the hell they're doing? Then they're like, 
in this pile of metal, like with a wheel sticking out here and a face <laughs> where his crotch is supposed to be. Like, wouldn't that be what you do? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I like, I, like you're just looking at it, like looking at your watch. Like, are we done now? Like, mm-hmm. is it? God, how long is this going to take him to change from a car into a robot? Like, what the? But anyways, I'm going to watch Star Wars. Instead. Yeah, no, I when when he first ignited that lightsaber, I was like, oh my god, like. <laughs> You'd never seen anything why like does that. It st- why doesn't it stop? Like, why does it, you know, to keep going? You're thinking, why is it not, like, tw- 10,000 feet long? That is not a question I had, and I never have. I did. I was like, why, is it, why does it stop? I think it's the size of the crystals. Because they don't really get into that until yeah. later when you, you know, you can what adjust if the... What if it depends on the size of the crystals? The way the energy is focused and it's all that. Yeah, because yeah. be. like Darth, Darth Maul's uh, is double lightsaber. Eight. We could move the handle down. It could be bigger. No, isn't there yeah. a scene in is it Empire where Vader adjusts the the knob on his lightsaber? Does Someone it? does actually use like a knob on the right. saber in one of the movies. I forget which one it is. Is it not Empire? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the that's that's the Alpine radio system in the hilt. <laughs> It's like, it's like the golf bag in uh, Caddyshack where he's got a radio. In that's it. actually what the knob is. The knob turns on the lightsaber sound. So that's why right. it sounds different the first time because he dialed it back a little bit for the next time. Because he didn't have lithium ion kyber crystals back then. <laughs> right. Nice. Hey, thanks for reminding me. I need AAA batteries for my sound, sound system remote at home. I'm, no, tired isn't... Of, I'm tired of going up to the wall to turn it on and off. <laughs> isn't, isn't the like showing working on the, li- on the lightsaber? That's a Luke thing. I thought that was actually. I know it's the deleted oh, deleted scene in Jedi, but yeah, yeah. Or maybe you're you're watching. You're thinking of when Vader was in his ship at the end of Episode Four, and he's dialing that knob. You know yeah, what? I wonder if that's yoke. what I'm. Th- maybe. Yeah, that's when he was. Yeah, he was. He was. He was cha- again. He was changing the radio station, <laughs> turning on the windshield wipers or something. By the way, um, okay, sorry, I, I'm going to go serious again, but. Uh, <laughs> Oh no! Okay. How Vader, dare we have a serious discussion? <laughs> Vader flying the ship, like oh. I never considered that his his suit was like a space suit, but that's that's since been made official. But it makes perfect sense, really. I mean, I don't know why I never considered that before. That you know he's in his ent- entire suit, and it might be vacuum sealed so he could survive in space. Makes perfect sense. I thought it was really cool. Now that I look back on Episode Four, and he's actually flying the ship, and I'm like, he didn't have to change clothes. Oh, because he's already in a spacesuit. Makes sense to me. I never thought about that. It's, what if the buttons... It's got to be hot in there, though. What, what all the, time. Yeah, all the, the leather. buttons on his uh, He's already burnt chest, by lava. What if the buttons on his uh, chest um, changes that? Yeah, that's supposed be. to, I think. Could be like, you know, like, one like button like lets in the atmosphere and that... the, other bu- the other button seals it off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, never, I never thought about it, but I mean, because you always, you always see... I mean, like... Han Solo's in regular clothes in the Millennium Falcon. They're always in spaceships in normal clothes. I never even thought about Vader having to have it. That's one thing the Empire had right because the TIE fighter pilots, same thing. They had a sealed suit. The, the Rebels are just in a flight helmet like a airplane pilot would have. I don't... I, I mean, I mean, the, the cockpit blows on an X-Wing. You're dead. But, you know, TIE fighter gets blown up. You might be able to survive for a little while. <laughs> That's one thing they show. They give them crappy, Isn't fragile it? ships, but man, they, they at least let them survive in space after they get blown up. Well, Finn and Poe survived, and they yeah. crash landed on a planet inside of one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boy, those well, things really are like five star crash test rating on those X wings, huh? <laughs> well, that's the thing is, I wonder. I actually kind of wondered about that because Tie Fighters never had two seats in them before either. So I think maybe that's just that special forces Tie Fighter that they were using. Because it, yeah. in, in the rest of Force Awakens, the regular TIE fighters look to just be the same ship with inverted colors. So maybe there's a two-seat model for the Special Forces with the extra gunner position, and then there's the regular model that's just, you know, one That one's just only. handicap accessible. <laughs> right. There's the, tie, there's the TIE fighter coupe and the TIE fighter sedan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in, in episode eight, they're going to have the TIE fighter hatchback. Dude, I want to see. Have, the you're return. gonna have one guy flying, or you have one guy, one guy shooting, and the other guy's like putting groceries away. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's got the power lift gate. They walk up to it, just wave their foot. <laughs> when it's <is> heating, <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, where's the in- infotainment system on this thing? <laughs> like, <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, why don't we close up shop here? I uh, want to thank Andy and Grant, you guys, for coming over. Hope you guys had a good time. Thank you for having us. It was a blast. Anytime. Uh, AJ? Yes. Another Steve-less show. We're going to have to get on him for that. This is the second time. Maybe Steve is Snoke. <laughs> yeah, right. Steve is Snoke. He, he's off training Kylo right now. <laughs> right. Nice. Well, again, oh, sorry, buddy. I uh, want to thank everybody for listening. You can find us at nerfherdercouncil.com. We do have our Facebook page. 
and we have the Twitter account at NHC Podcast. Hit us up there. We have our voicemail number where you can give us a call and leave us a message and interact with us. Give What's us that number? It is four four zero nine eight seven wars. So uh, nine two seven seven spells out wars. So you can hit us up there, leave us a message if you want us to talk about something, give us your opinion on something we've said. Um, we got all the usual places. Spreaker is our main uh, main app that we use for the podcast. You can also find us in a number of other places. So thanks again for checking out another episode of the Nerf Herder Council. I'm your host, JT, at Dog Pound Jedi. He's AJ. At Drake Adams 579 He's Andy. What's your Twitter? At Sarcastic Junk. There you go. And we will catch you next time. Bolts is never going to get us past that blockade. This bucket's got a few surprises left in her. Plus, me and Chewie are on it. Ain't that right, Chewie? Hell yeah, you my nerf herder. You my nerf herder.